Thank you for coming tonight. This is a geology lecture given here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Let's look at the title. Okay, wow, all right. Paleomagnetism in the Pacific Northwest. Looks like that's what's on the menu. That sounds hard. Uh, I don't know, am I the guy to give a lecture on paleomagnetism? I'm not a geophysicist. I'm a guy that teaches Geology 101 at Central Washington University, like right over there. I've been teaching for a long time. Am I the person to give a full hour lecture on paleomagnetism and how the Earth's magnetic field works and how the polarity flips and how there's polar wander and everything else? No, I'm not the person. But yet I'm standing up here giving this talk. So, so why do I feel like I'm qualified? Well, I teach for a living. I know Washington geology quite well now. I've lived here for 35 years, so that's great. And this past winter, I did a YouTube series of 26 interviews with geologists from around the country and in a few cases in other countries. And many of them were paleomagnetic specialists. And so I read their papers, I talked to them directly, I, the live crowd that was watching on the internet was inter asking them questions, I feel like I got to know them. And so before I forget it all, I'm getting older now, before I forget it all, I feel like this is the time to take some of the beautiful paleomagnetic field data that's been compiled for the last 50 years and place it into some sort of context. And I can't hold it, I got to say it. This paleomag data that we're talking about tonight has been essentially ignored by the geologic community for 50 years. 50 years. And it's not just a couple people doing the paleomag work. There's a lot of work that's been done. And so the context of this, and maybe why you're confused possibly, why would all this work be not really valued or read or referred to on a regular basis? I think there's two answers for that. The first one is, you don't learn paleomag when you get a geology degree. I didn't learn paleomagnetism when I got a geology degree. I haven't taught about paleomagnetism in my classes. It's kind of a fringe topic among the mainstream geology community. So that's one reason. But I think a more interesting reason is, if you look carefully and read all the paleomagnetic work that's been done, on crust from Alaska down to California and west of the Rocky Mountains, that paleomagnetic data disagrees with the conventional answer for why the Rocky Mountains exist. And that old model, which I refer to, maybe you've seen it on YouTube, I did a lecture this spring on how did the Rocky Mountains form? And I'm gonna do it very quickly right now. The old conventional model of how the Rocky Mountains formed is you take a big oceanic plate called the Farallon Plate, you move it east. I'm talking about how we're forming the Rocky Mountains. You do that subduction starting 180 million years ago. You have this big ocean plate diving beneath. You make the geology of California. You change the angle of the subducting Farallon Plate. You shallow it out, in other words so that you can actually get that Farallon plate underneath the Rocky Mountains, and you create these thrust faults of the severe style Rocky Mountain uplift, and you form these Laramide block uplifts in Colorado and Wyoming. That is the conventional majority opinion, the majority rule for how the Rocky Mountains formed with an eastward moving oceanic plate. That idea was proposed in the early 1970s, and it is still, 50 years later, the conventional wisdom. Well, that model in that lecture I gave earlier this spring is under some doubt because we have found subducted ocean slabs underneath North America, and that old Farallon plate isn't there. The Farallon plate that's supposed to be subducting shallow, it's not there. It's in the wrong depth, it's in the wrong place. There's nothing that works with that model. So that's check mark number one, why that model maybe is not what we want anymore. 
But that's new data that we didn't have in 1970. Old data that we did have in the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s and the 2000s and the 2010s, 50 years of paleomagnetic work, says that all of this crust between 85 and 55 million years ago moved north more than 1,000 miles. I'll give you some specific numbers in a second. Now, if you're a person who wants the Farallon plate moving east to make the Rockies, and most do, then are you truly going to be enthusiastically reading and supporting other papers on paleomagnetism that show everything moving north? I don't think you are. It doesn't agree with the model. But I think it's time to look at that paleomag work carefully and, again, question or maybe just view the Rocky Mountains with a new set of eyes. That's the goal tonight. Okay, that was the hook. I don't know if it worked. That's the hook. That was, that we're ready. Like We want to look at it now. Thank you. But I'm going to keep that here. I'm going to use a prop, believe it or not. Uh, but the prop is because I don't like this drawing. I tried it. I don't think I like it. It's like a basketball, I guess. What is this? And uh, the prop is this old exercise ball from the basement that I brought in here. Okay, so here's my attempt to explain how paleomagnetism works in less than five minutes. Oh boy. All right, I'll do this. So this is our planet, planet Earth. And there's an invisible magnetic field. These red lines, the, Earth, the giant magnet, the Earth is like a giant magnet. So these invisible magnetic field lines look like this. And they flip occasionally, that's not a point tonight. There's an invisible magnetic field through this auditorium right now, we can't see it. If you're making a list for why people are not accepting paleomagnetism, this is invisible data. This is, invi this is invisible field. And when you look at a rock that's been studied paleomagnetically, you, you can't see anything, just holding the rock as you're on your hike. So it's an act of faith to even get to the point where you're listening to someone doing paleomagnetic research. Okay, but this is our magnetic field, these invisible pink lines converging at the poles. But the point is that green here is the surface of our planet. And I don't know if it's possible here, but maybe you can see that at the equator, the invisible magnetic field lines are parallel to the surface of the Earth. Parallel to the surface of the Earth. And therefore, if you have a ferromagnetic mineral in a rock that's cooling, magma that's cooling, at the equator, you can measure the orientation of those iron particles. And if you're at the equator, those iron particles frozen in your rock during the time of that magma turning to solid rock is going to be parallel to the Earth's surface. That's proof that that magma was cooling at the equator. Conversely, if you have a volcanic eruption at the North or South Pole at any time in the past, and that magma starts cooling, and if that magma does have iron-rich particles within it, then the magma is going to record invisible magnetic field lines vertically intersecting with the surface. And so the angle between the orientation of the magnetic field lines and the orientation of the magnetic particle and the Earth's surface, the paleo-horizontal, is a much higher angle. That's a lot of words. Let me try it with the ball, see if it works any better. Equator, North Pole, Santa Claus lives up there. I'm a magnetic grain at the equator, I am going to be frozen in place parallel to the Earth's surface at the equator. Now I'm an iron particle being frozen into a rock at the North Pole. I'm going to be perpendicular to the Earth's surface. Those are the two extremes. But what if we're at 45 degrees north latitude, halfway between the equator and the North Pole? I'm going to have an angle between my finger and the Earth's surface that is 45 degrees. I'm not going to be 90. I'm not going to be zero. I'm talking about the inclination now. 
the inclination of the grains. So inclination is what we want. Inclination, the angle between the orientation of the magnetic grain and the paleo-horizontal, the old land surface. And so tonight we're going to hear about reports of bedrock that has shallow inclinations. And that means the angle between the iron particle and the paleo-horizontal is a low angle, a shallow inclination. That means we formed close to the equator. If we have a great inclination, not a shallow, but a great inclination, we are closer to the pole. So we can determine paleo latitude by carefully measuring the orientation of the iron particles inside of an igneous rock or a sedimentary layer. That was my best attempt to explain where these latitudes are coming from and ultimately how we can come up with a way to say that portions of Washington have moved north during the time that the Rocky Mountains were building. I feel like I need to cut to something real. I don't know, I feel like I'm, I'm needing to get it to a punchline somehow right off the bat. I wanna give you one right now and then I'll go to the next board. So I'm pulling an audible right now, okay? This says MSB, that's Mount Stewart Batholith. So 50 years ago, the 50th anniversary, 50 years ago, the first paleomagnetic paper came out. And out of all the mountains in all the American West, guess which mountain we're talking about? That one right over there, Mount Stewart. The Mount Stewart Batholith was selected to be a case study for determining, did the granite of Mount Stewart truly crystallize here in Washington? So MSB is on this tiny little map, MSB is on this larger map, same thing, Mount Stewart Batholith. The Mount Stewart Batholith today is roughly at 47 degrees north, just a touch more, but play along, 47 degrees north. And 90 million years ago, 90 million years ago, when the magnetic field was locked into that rock of the Mount Stewart granite, The Mount Stewart Batholith was down off the bottom of the chalkboard. Where's 22 degrees north? It's down here. 22 degrees north at 90 degrees, uh, 22 degrees north 90 million years ago. And today Mount Stewart is at 47 degrees north. That's 25 degrees of latitude motion between 85 and 55 million years ago. Based on what? Based on the shallow inclinations of the magnetite grains in the Mount Stewart granite. Now that was published, oh, thank you for the reaction. That was published to a resounding thud. The guy that wrote the paper was Merle Beck, a brand new professor. Oh, round of applause for Merle Beck. Some of you know about him. He was a longtime professor at Western Washington University and was a pioneer in many ways and passed away just a couple months ago. But he and his colleagues on the Washington side and a contemporary of Merle Beck, Ted Irving, over at Victoria in Sydney, British Columbia, in British, uh, British Columbia Geological Survey, they were doing this paleomag work back in the 1950s, the 1960s, and so on. And they started coming up with papers that showed this kind of transport. My point is, they're publishing and nobody's reading these things. Or they're publishing, some geologists are reading those things and saying, I'm going to drop that and walk away because that does not agree with what we're trying to talk about here, which was the Farallon plate model. The data continues to be strong, and it's not just Mount Stewart. So we're now to the portion to talk about why field geologists that I know now, who I sit around the campfire with and talk about Baja BC, and that's what we're talking about right now, those geologists today that I value and respect, they go, oh, I, I don't think I'm it. 
it's from a Pluton, right? The Mount Stuart Batholith is a big blob of magma. Are you really thinking that that's good data? Is this somehow this magma just going to like ride beautifully almost 3,000 kilometers without tilting at all or folding or anything? That's like impossible. Think of how much tectonic action has happened in the American West. You can see their point. So let's address a little bit of that. So here's our friend again, Mount Stuart Batholith, Mount Stuart Batholith, Mount Stuart Batholith. So Merle Beck and Bernie Hausen, his contemporary today at Western Washington University and some others, and Ted Irving in the early days, were specializing in plutons. And we'll focus just on Mount Stewart if you like, the Mount Stewart Batholith. So it was liquid and hot between 96 and 91 million years ago. A revelation to me recently is that the age of paleomagnetic signature in the Mount Stewart batholith did not precisely happen during the age of crystallization. And there's some detailed physics and chemistry to explain that. But I'm going to give you those dates. The Mount Stewart batholith between 96 and 91 was molten. It finally solidified. And there's ways, according to the paleomagnetist people, to say that it was 90 million years ago that we lock in the paleomagnetic signature. The shallow inclinations to tell us that that Mount Stewart batholith was originally in Mexico. I'm drawing a picture of the magma being liquid when it was down south of the border. And you're like, oh, I don't quite get that. Why wouldn't the magnetites lock in at that time? That's a detailed question that I'm not equipped to answer, but I asked Bernie Hausen on some of these programs this winter, and he answered it beautifully, I think. I tried to follow. The point is important, though, because some people say, as field geologists, look at Mount Stewart Batholith on a map, and we're going to do that in a bit. That batholith on a map up by Stevens Pass is folded. It makes a horseshoe pattern on a map looking down from heaven. You can see it. The Chewakam Schist is folded. The Ingalls Ophiolite is... Everybody's folded. How can you take this paleomag data to heart? But then you realize that the magnetism is locking in after the folding. The folding predates the magnetic setting in. That's one example of the detail that we need. This magma turns to stone. It stays underground. It makes its journey from 23 degrees north to 47 degrees north, and it pops up to the surface less than 10 million years ago. Okay, that maybe doesn't work for a geologist watching this lecture right now. And they go, ah, that still sounds kind of shaky to me. Well, that's one batholith. Are all the batholiths of the American West agreeing with Mount Stewart batholith, with this paleomag business, with moving 3,000, I'll give you the number, 2,900 kilometers north? That's what the paleomag said in 1972. That's what the paleomag still says today, with new checks, with new data, with new paleopole positions. Well, no, not all the Plutons do agree. If you go to the Snoqualmie batholith, it's younger than 55 million years ago. There's no paleomag movement at all. It didn't move north at all. Any pluton younger than 55 million years ago is too young for this northward trip. And likewise, any, or, uh, any uh, pluton that's older than 100 million years ago doesn't show this movement either. So there's a time window with certain plutons in this time area and before, but let's just say 100 to 50, Rocky Mountain time, that these things are moving north. Okay. Well, maybe it's just one person. Maybe it's just one lab that's getting these weird numbers. No, it's a bunch of labs. It's a bunch of people. There's paleomagnetic people doing work around the world. It's not just a couple of schools here in the Northwest.
Well, let's say you're persistent, as some of my buddies are who talk about this, and they go, well, I just, I just, I gotta, I gotta rule out those plutons. I just, it's still just kind of a blob. I can't, I can't make it work for my brain. I don't believe it, basically. Well, let's go to MT. And MT is another very important paleomagnetic site. And MT is going to stand for Mount Tatlow. And this is a famous location, and among the paleomag people, it's bulletproof. It's bulletproof. And what they mean is, they're going to look at paleomagnetic indicators, not from a pluton, not from a blob, where it is tough to figure out, admittedly, where the paleo-horizontal is. You remember with the, with the exercise ball? We need that paleo-horizontal. We need to measure that inclination. So Mount Tatlow doesn't have plutonic material. Mount Tatlow is a series of layers. Some of them lava flows with iron particles. Some of them sedimentary layers with iron particles. And it's not like the Grand Canyon of Mount Tatlow. They have been folded but as a paleomag person, you drill into these lavas. You don't have to guess where paleo-horizontal is. You can see the bedding planes between these layers. And even though they're contorted into big McDonald arches or something like that, you can measure the PMAG and you can do what's known as a fold test. You can get those tilted layers back to their original position. And so therefore you can take your drilled paleomagnetic inclinations and rotate them to get them back to the original paleomag and the paleo-horizontal. Well, that work has been done by Ted Irving and Jane Wynn and Randy Ankin. And guess what they came up with? The same number. Mount Tatlow moved 2,900 kilometers Roughly the same age, 90 million year old material, locked in with paleomag, starting down here, getting up here. And you're like, well, hold on. No, no Mount Tatlow is a little bit farther north. Shouldn't that number be a little bit higher? Well, it should, but there's a big fault called the Straight Creek Fault that took the crust in western Washington starting 50 million years ago and moved it about 100 miles north across the border. So if we undo the offset on the Straight Creek Fault, which is younger than 50 million years, Mount Tatlow is right over there. And so those translation or transport distances work. So for some geologists that I know, Chris Mattinson, for instance, who didn't know much of this, even though he's a very bright guy, he's like, to me, that Mount Tatlow thing is just like, that's it. I, I, I get it now. I wasn't really understanding why the plutons were that valuable, but that field check of these other kinds of layers, that's going to work for me. Loving the energy in the room, You're locked in, just like the paleomag. We're going one more place, but we're not quite ready. I want to do some verbal things quick, and I think these visuals are really going to help us. So it's almost like we're eating our vegetables right now before it all kind of comes together, I think, with the magic of the audio visuals. Mostly visuals, not audio. Okay, let's revisit. We really are just selecting two sites so far in the American far west, west of the Rocky Mountains. And that kind of looks like, doesn't it, that if we ignore this, because this is too young, this is, this is something that's happened after Mount Stewart has made its big journey. That's after both of these guys have come up from Mexico. So let's get, let's get rid of the Straight Creek Falls. It's not that important. But what we are kind of looking at is realizing that, oh my Lord, if there are other places of the right age 
in Washington, Oregon, California, British Columbia, maybe even further points north, does that mean, does that mean that all of this stuff moved almost 3,000 kilometers north? And if you talk to the paleomagnetist people, the answer is yes. This is the same stuff if you saw that Rocky Mountain lecture earlier this spring, this is the same stuff that was out in the water as a fixed archipelago that North America ran into. And so there's a new model called the hit and run model where North America hits this fixed oceanic island out in the water. And then that same thing that we hit, which is now on our hood, like we're, we're just this big old Buick going down the country road. We run into this big, deer out in the middle of moose out in the middle of the road the moose slams onto our front grill and then the moose starts sliding off to the right hit and run the moose hits our windshield and then gets flung off to the right hand side of the windshield up to 3,000 kilometers between 85 and 55 million years ago so in the series I was doing this past winter, we had an idea about a whale, a whale that was migrating to the north. And this crust is the stuff that was out in the water. It hits North America 100 million years ago. And then starting 85 million years ago, there's evidence, paleomagnetic evidence, that this stuff starts moving north, these kinds of distances. And that feels kind of satisfying. And there are some geologists who like that only. But that's not everything west of the Rocky Mountains. That's like stuff within a day's drive of the ocean. That's a, a, dry, a day's drive inland from the ocean. That's the stuff that's moving north, according to many of the paleomagnetic papers. And the idea is, can I do this quickly? The idea is that I'm going to round off some numbers now. 3,000 kilometers of northward motion here. And then you go a little bit further inland. This is mostly Ted Irving's work. 200, 2,000 kilometers moving north, and then by the time you get this far inland, there's no movement north. So the general idea is that as you work your way inland, there's less and less northward motion. And that all feels pretty good, except some of those same paleomagnetic people that I was interviewing this past winter, and now we're talking about Randy Ankin and Jane Wynn and Stephen Johnston did a very important paleomagnetic stu study in the Yukon, a place called CG, the Carmax Group. I didn't know anything about the Carmax Group until this winter. I'm now really into the Carmax Group. The Carmax Group are lavas, no sediments, just a stack of lavas, flood basalts, way up here in the Yukon. But they have the right minerals to do paleomagnetic work on. And those three folks, Randy, Jane, and Stephen, were up there drilling like crazy, multiple parties, multiple times in the Carmax. And the Carmax group is 70 million years old. The lavas, young compared to Mount Stewart and Mount Tatlin. And yet, there's 1,900 kilometers of northward motion of the Carmax group in the Yukon, based on the shallow inclinations of the magnetic grains. Now, I'm pausing for dramatic effect because first of all, we're quite a ways inland. And we're so young. I thought this was 85 to 55. Now you're saying this stuff that's so far young, that's so far inland and young is starting to move 70? Maybe all of this motion is starting 70 million years ago and not 85. But if you start doing that, and start realizing, and I think I need to put the Carmax, I think my map's off a little bit. I need to get the Carmax group in here. Because the idea is, now, if we have the Carmax group showing this kind of northward motion according to the paleomag, 
we need some sort of a fault sending material north to the east of the CarMax group, which suddenly is way the hell over here. And geologists, since that CarMax work, some of them have been looking through, do you know the geology here? This is like Glacier National Park. This is like something called the Belt Supergroup and the Purcell Supergroup. These are fine grain shales and siltstones. And somewhere in all of that, apparently there's some sort of major fault, like the San Andreas that's sending everything, a mega whale to the north. So there's the potential of this paleomagnetic data really blowing things open, really changing the way we view much of not only stuff to the west of the Rockies, stuff within the Rockies. Portions of those thrust faults are now up in Alberta. Is that an accident? Did they get moved north with the rest of what was a major fat ribbon continent? Okay, let's add some visuals to this now. I think that's what we need. So here's to Merle Beck. who was a real character uh, and just lit up on screen when we interviewed him uh, for a variety of projects. So this is me visiting him in the, in the hardest part of the lockdown uh, in his backyard in Bellingham, Washington. And uh, I knew Merle at that point because uh, a few years earlier, maybe 10 years ago now, we drove from Ellensburg up to Bellingham where Merle was working and interviewed him. And that's where I first got to know Merle and his story. And so here's some screenshots from that uh, PBS program that we did uh, featuring Merle Beck from Western Washington University. And right off the bat, I mean, he wasn't screwing around. Like this guy has been ignored in the scientific community for a long time. So, I mean, he was, he was like, hey, you know, these guys don't even know how paleomag works, you know? And, and just, you know, it, 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 it becomes personal in a hurry when you talk to someone who works so hard and does such great work and the work is just not appreciated. And that's an understatement. Here's Merle back in the day in the Stewart Range in the early 1970s. Uh, he, they still have those samples. So this is what these, these little drill cores look like. So you take a power drill out to some bedrock, you drill into it, you take it back, you carefully measure the orientation of that little core, and then you do your analyses in the paleomagnetic labs when they get the back. These are the, the little billets that we get the inclination data from. Don't ask me more than that. I barely know this. But that's Mount Stewart granite right there, collected in the early 70s. Bernie Hausen was hired at Western Washington after Merle retired, or he was the hand-picked successor to Merle, and Bernie has continued to do some amazing work. And there's a brand new scientific paper by Merle Beck, sorry, by Basil Tickoff and Bernie Hausen that came out this year, 2023. So the last interview I got with Merle was just last summer in August, and, and Merle passed away in January of 2023. A similar vintage pioneer is Ted Irving. So Merle Beck and Ted Irving were the two that were really leading the charge with this paleomagnetic work. And so here's Ted Irving up in Sydney, British Columbia, compiling more paleomagnetic data. And Ted Irving had this sweet uh, life-size globe to work with and plot his paleopoles and other paleomagnetic information. And this is the series that I put together this past winter, which uh, perhaps more than anything else, just introduced all of these workers to a wider audience. And we got a chance to hear them directly, learn from them and get to know them. So for instance, Ted Irving here in the middle, we're up in Sydney, British Columbia now, Ted Irving has retired and his handpicked successor is Randy Enkin from a photo uh, more than 10 years ago now. So I hustled and tried to convince all these folks to join me uh, with these interviews and all the interviews exist on, online. You're welcome to go uh, take a look at any of these. Each of the interviews I think uh, you might find interesting. So Randy from his office. And Randy sharing photographs. Many of these geologists and paleomag people had selected slides they wanted to share with everybody. It was an audience for the first time. I don't want to overstate it too much, but 
this beautiful work is finally being absorbed and spread uh, to a, uh, an audience that deserves to, to, to hear it and to read it and to see it. So here's Randy in the field collecting some of these drills. You've got to bust your butt to get up to these, some of these spots. I think this photo is from the Carmax up in Yukon with Randy Ankin drilling. And here are the actual, some of the actual drill uh, bits, the billets from the Carmax in the Yukon. And I see that Jane Wynn has her name on this drawer. So interviewed Jane Wynn. Uh, and many of these folks are retired now themselves and out of the game. Here's Merle Beck's first student at Western. And the names Linda Noson and Merle Beck are always together when people bring this up. So to get Linda to get on camera was a bit of a chore, but I finally talked her into it. And she was the first of the series. Bernie Housen, the guy that I mentioned at Western now. Stephen Johnston, who uh, mainly wrote the new paper, or the paper in the last 15 years, on the ribbon continent using the CARMAX data. So without the CARMAX lavas and the paleomag results from the CARMAX, Stephen Johnston wouldn't have gotten this idea of having a major portion. Basically, everything west of the Rocky Mountains was together out in the Pacific as something called a fixed ribbon continent. Robert Hildebrand, not collecting the paleomag himself, but writing papers to this day, probably writing this evening at his home in Tucson and continuing to make beautiful maps to compile this data. So he's been very prolific in the last 10, 15 years doing work based on paleomagnetic work. Basil Tickoff, embracing the paleomag. So there's, there's, there's momentum right now. Who knows how long it will last, but there's momentum right now with this paleomag work, dusting this stuff off, incorporating in some new discussions. And that's what's exciting about this, this topic in this particular point in time. The last show of the series, just last month, we had multiple heads on camera discussing these things openly. And I have to say it, the, the, the vibe of what we were doing is different than the vibe that's been going on for many decades before. The vibe before was, I don't like your data. I'm not talking to you. And back and forth, shots fired. Uh, and the, 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 there's the new Penrose conference happening this summer in Idaho. And hopefully these kinds of discussions will continue with a collaborative view instead of the opposite. There's others who have embraced the paleomag without doing them themselves. This is Daryl Cowan, University of Washington, tremendously helpful with this. So in these other spring lectures, I have not involved people, personalities, and personal stories necessarily with the geologists, but tonight I did feel it was important to include them and introduce those faces to you. There are people behind all this very careful work. Okay, well, the exercise ball, maybe this helps a little bit. These are slides from Randy Enkin and a slide from a Geology 101 textbook. Not sure if this is helping you or not. Uh, but the idea that you can precisely locate the old latitude of a rock, if you know the age, using paleomagnetic inclinations is not a new thing and needs to be incorporated into the tectonic models that we're talking about now. And yeah, Mount Stewart, just north of our little town, is where it all started. This is that original map from that first paper proposing this crazy amount of movement from Mexico up to Northern Washington. A map of the Stevens Pass area heading down to this portion, which is closer to Leavenworth. Maybe you can see it's been folded. It looks like a big hook. Here's a more accurate map from Bernie Hausen and Merle Beck 20 years later. 30 years later. This Leavenworth's down here, Icicle Canyon, and up by Stevens Pad at the hook. It has been folded, but the, uh, the inclination of the magnetic grains is slightly younger than the folding. Uh, the last email I got from Merle right before Christmas, a few months ago, uh, he wanted to get a hold of his 1976 paper. And in his words, that was his best work. So if you only find one paper by Merle Beck uh, that he was most proud of, it's this American Journal of Science, June 1976 paper. 
Here's another way to plot how unusual some of these rocks are, and it's gonna be hard to understand these plots. Let me try it quickly. This is North America, Cratonic North America, meaning the old part of North America's continent. And these orange circles up here are the paleomagnetic poles. So if you drill into uh, 90 million year old granites in South Dakota, and you figure out the inclinations and you do all your measurements, you figure out that the magnetic pole at 120 million years ago or 130 million years ago or 110 million years ago, all of these cratonic plutons and even lavas are telling you that's where the pole is. It makes sense, it's what's expected. If you do the same thing and find some rocks to drill paleomag holes into from the craton, at 70 million years, 79, 66 million years ago. Again, there's a cluster and it makes sense with the position of where North America was at that time. But how about you do the drilling in Mount Stewart or Mount Tatlow or Carmax or many of these other volcanic, sedimentary and plutonic rocks in the far west? That's what they look like. They are unexpected, they are discordant. Those plots are gibberish until you realize that all of these sites have moved. They're not in the position that they were formed like the rest of the craton. Are you starting to see why this is a paleomagnetic place to work in the far west, west of the Rockies? So if you have heard of this thing called Baja BC, these iconic maps drawn by Darrell Cowan, University of Washington, put out in 1997, are showing the proposal. This is the whale moving its way north and everything within this whale started down south and moved north and that's based on the paleomagnetic data. Well, is it that crazy to suggest that that's a thing? That a sliver of westernmost North America is moving north? Hell, it's happening right now, right? This is Baja, Mexico. It hasn't always been like this. I'm talking about very recent geology now. 10 million years ago, this was part of mainland Mexico. So we have current versions of big pieces of North America moving north. Everything west of the San Andreas Fault in California, we have the GPS, we know that that's moving north along a strike-slip fall. It's not like this is the only time this has ever happened in the history of the Western North American margin. And we, yes, we typically visualize strike-slip faults, the most recent major famous motion on the strike-slip fault in this section of the San Andreas, the great 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, which decimated downtown San Francisco. I'm just trying to give you a sense that this has been an ongoing thing for 100 million years in Western North America with this motion north of blocks of crust to the west of the fall. In 1906, look at the length in yellow that ruptured. Not the entire fault, but a large portion of the San Andreas Fault suddenly moved 10 feet on the west side compared to the east side. Well, if you get up in a drone and you fly north along the San Andreas Fault, it's just as fresh as can be. Is this what we should be visualizing for a Baja BC-like fault coming through central Washington, coming through Spokane? Or if you're a ribbon continent mega whale person coming through Glacier Park? Or maybe we shouldn't ver visualize a perfectly vertical fault that allows this northward motion. Is it possible something like the Lewis Thrust Fault, which is a low angle fault between two pizza boxes can you slide a pizza box north on top of the pizza box that's below it? Does it have to just be an east-west motion? These are basic questions, but that's where we are right now. We're in an open discussion phase, at least I hope we are this summer, when a bunch of these experts get together at the next Penrose Conference. I'm still down in San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Francisco's up there, Los Angeles is down here. There's bedrock matches that show major amounts of northward motion. Maybe not 3,000 kilometers, but this is motion that's just happened in the last 30 million years. 
Even in Washington, that Straight Creek Fault, which is too young for our Baja BC time, but it is a thing. We have the same kind of offset bedrock that can be matched up. Some of you know Cleellum, Washington, that's close to here. Burlington, Washington, that's not close to here, but they used to be suburbs of each other. 50 million years ago, before we started motion on the Straight Creek Fault. So it's almost like you can take your pick which generation of the American West you want to pick, and there is dextral or right lateral offset happening on many faults throughout the American West. So you're hearing my point. It's not crazy to have paleomag suggesting this kind of northward motion. If we go back down to Southern Cal for a second, here's Tanya Atwater helping us see that just using the paleomag and some other constraints that we have on the ocean floor, we can take Santa Barbara and rotate it. We can have San Diego moving north. Hell, we got stuff coming from Mexico right on this animation. The Selenian block is Mexican crust, maybe even Central American crust. It's made it its way to Southern California. So to view this concept of Baja, I'm pissed now suddenly, I don't know why. To, to view this concept of moving stuff north thousands of kilometers is the more you think about it and the more you think about what you know about basic geology 101 in the American West, it fits right in. It's not the aberration that it maybe appears at first glance. Yes, Vindman's Bakery, shout out to them and Jeff at Vindman's Bakery making props for the series. At, oh, sure. And Jeff is here tonight. And the idea that these whales are representing portions that have moved north based on the paleomag, we probably put a, should have put some little magnetic flakes inside of that whale to really show the inclination properly, Jeff. Getting greedy now. But the mess that we have, the mess that we have up in Yukon, up the entire state of Alaska is made out of exotic terrains. Many of them fragments that, depending on who you talk to, came from thousands of kilometers to the south. Isn't this a new way to view the American West? Even when having discussions with these geologists a couple months ago, I would catch myself in the middle of the conversation. I'd go, well, let's go up to Yukon with Stephen and talk about that geology. And I'd go, well, no, wait, that stuff was almost 2000, that stuff was almost down here. So you have to do all this mental restoration of these puzzle pieces. You can see how complicated it is. Can you imagine doing a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, and, and the pieces are in seven different rooms in your house, and the first step is just to get them all onto one card table? And you've got to use the paleomag to do it, to get them back to the right card table? My goodness. So it's not a shock, probably, that we're still trying to figure out much of this material. Okay, I think the last thing I want to say before we quit is that if you pull back as Robert Hildebrand has been doing with his gorgeous maps. And you squint a little bit, you can see a significant portion of the crust west of the Rocky Mountains moving north. So this greenish tan are the Rocky Mountains. And you can see these red blotches and maybe you can even see these liniments that perhaps were restored. Now, even Hildebrand, over his last 10, 15 years, has been ignored or uh, been given the same treatment as the paleomag papers. This is too simple. This is too outlandish. We're not even going to comment on it. That's generally the, the talk. But I think we have so many questions right now, it's silly for anybody just to say, well, that's obviously way out to lunch. I'm not gonna even talk about that anymore. I don't think you can say that with anybody's data. As long as it's good data, let's use it, let's incorporate it. So these kinds of maps that show a lot of crust moving north, perhaps in the next decade will become less and less outlandish. Mega whale, courtesy of Randy Ankin. The last thing I want to show you, we're going to skip that, we're going to skip that, we're going to skip that. The last thing I want to show you is an animation I've shown in the two previous lectures this spring. This is the same animation I'm going to show again. I'm going to drive it. But before I play it this time, I want to point out a couple of things. The orange and the yellow are out in the Pacific Ocean 
170 million years ago, according to this model. And the purple has already been added to North America. So there's open ocean between the purple part of North America and orange and yellow out in the water. Now, if you really want the mega whale, if you really want everything west of the Rocky Mountains being sent north, and you want everything west of the Rocky Mountains being added as one big hunk, you want the purple out there with the orange and the yellow. You want a major ribbon continent out in the water and one major splodam, kabam, whatever, collision. And then that thing moves as a unit to the north. To me personally, that's attractive. But among these different models, it's not universally accepted. I'm showing you this one, which doesn't want that mega whale or that mega ribbon continent. Instead, this is the insular and the alicitos out in the water and the intermontane oreata. But the reason I'm showing you to this again is because this is Karin Siglock and Mitch Mahalanuk's model based on the slabs in the lower mantle. This is not a model that's looking carefully at tonight's topic. And yet, I'm gonna play it for you and you're gonna see a familiar action. Let's do it without talking. You let me know when you see something familiar pertaining to tonight's topic. We're at 100 million years ago, coming right now. Oh, 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 oh. And I'm gonna play that one more time. It's going right now. And I feel like I wanna emphasize it one more time. I specifically asked Karn in the last show in February. Did you actively use the paleomagnetic data put into this model? And she said, no. The position of the ribbon candy, the position of those things that are fixed in the lower mantle, if we bring those back up to the surface, there's a certain geometry and we need that northward translation to make sense of where the slabs are in the lower mantle. To me, that alone is a beautiful endorsement from a completely different data set that supports the value of this paleomagnetic work. An old cartoon that still kind of makes me happy in its simplicity. Sometimes the most simple things are the most pleasant. And is that simple? I guess it is. You take Mount Stewart north of Ellensburg, Washington, and you stamp Mexico on it, you feel pretty good about things. That's where we're gonna leave it tonight. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you very much. I love you. Thank you for coming tonight.